Welcome to Abraham Out of One Many, an engaging art exhibition brought to you by Interfaith Ministries for Greater Houston and curated by Caravan, an international arts NGO nonprofit that is recognized as a leader in using the arts to further our global quest for a more harmonious future, both with each other and with the earth. Interfaith Ministries is Houston's oldest service organization. Dialogue, collaboration, and service have been at the heart of our work for over 50 years. Our programs fall into four areas. We are Texas's largest Meals on Wheels program covering six counties, but primarily in Harris and Galveston counties. We're one of the top 10 largest Meals on Wheels programs in the country. We also have a strong Refugee Services Resettlement Program working with Episcopal Migration Ministries to help resettle refugees into the Houston area. Volunteer Houston connects individuals, groups, and companies with nonprofit agencies to transform the greater Houston community for good through volunteerism. And interfaith relations and community partnerships fosters understanding, respect, and engagement among people of all faiths. IRCP is thrilled to be able to host this exhibit. Please visit www.imgh.org to learn more about us. Between April 20th and May 21st, we hosted Abraham out of one many, virtual exhibit of 15 paintings by three celebrated artists from the Middle East. We had planned to host these paintings in person in our Brigitte and Bashar Kalai Plaza of Respect and Great Hall in April of 2020, but COVID derailed those plans. We were thrilled to work with Caravan to create a virtual gallery experience so that we were able to reschedule the exhibit. A virtual experience allowed for a wide variety of accessible programs, including the program you're about to enjoy. We are grateful to the sponsors that made this event possible, especially our lead donors, Joni and David Andrews, Debbie and Floyd Kearns, Marion and Paul Cones, and Carol and Frank Gruen. This exhibit came to us through the incredible work of Caravan. Its mission is based on the belief that the arts can be one of the most effective mediums to heal our world and to creatively foster peace, harmony, wholeness, and health in all its forms. Caravan originated out of an artistic bridge building initiative in Cairo, Egypt in 2009 that focused on addressing the then growing chasm of discord and misunderstanding between the peoples, cultures, and creeds of the Middle East and the West. The nomadic caravan theme comes out of the founding vision to encourage and facilitate those from diverse backgrounds and worldviews to journey together through the arts. While Caravan's mission is global in focus, they maintain an ongoing program emphasis on the Middle East due to their founding. We invite you to visit oncaravan.org to learn more about the organization. Started in 2007, our Dinner Dialogue program is one of IRCP's longest running initiatives and has taken many forms and covered many topics since its inception. Even in a virtual format, our Dinner Dialogue allowed time for both compelling presentations as well as a virtual small group conversation. The title of this dialogue, Abraham in Conversation, highlights IAM's commitment to dialogue across all religions. Recognizing the Jewish, Christian, Muslim focus of the exhibit, this dialogue brought the Buddhist and Hindu artistic traditions into the conversation. We welcome Sahana Singh and Miyoki Kane Barrett as our guests. We'll di dinner dialogue, Abraham in conversation. Let me try to get me moved over here. There we go. We're grateful to Caravan for bringing this art to us and to our generous sponsors for making this exhibit. Uh, uh, making this exhibit and tonight's event possible. And you'll see those sponsors there listed on our screen. Since 2007, our dinner dialogues have been a staple of our interfaith work and have, ta um, and have taken many shapes and forms. They've been at ho in homes, they've been in our, um, uh, they, they've been in our, um, our great hall and they've been in houses of worship. People are not seeing the breakout room option. Oh, okay. Um, that probably so don't worry about that just yet. That probably will happen when I activate it. So when I tell you that the breakout rooms are open and you don't see an invitation to the breakout room, that's when you may need to look for the uh, for that option. So that should so that should not be a worry. Um, we've used a deck of cards of questions. We have used, uh, focused on different faiths. We've examined the elements of good dialogue. No matter, our dialogues have sought the to bring people together. Um, there we go. 
couple of quick announcements before I proceed. Um, please visit imgh.org. Click in the upper left-hand corner, or excuse me, the upper right-hand uh, up, uh, upper right-hand corner, and click on the Abraham event to learn about more about our closing uh, events as we come to the close of our hosting of uh, the, our month's worth of hosting this virtual exhibit. I would especially invite you to please sign up for our final closing event, which is the third annual Gershenson lecture, uh, which will be um, called Abraham out of one, uh, well, it's Abra um, Abraham and beyond the future of interreligious engagement, and I will be the lecturer this year. So that will be on uh, a week from tonight, Thursday, May the 20th. You should have, if you received an invitation to dinner dialogues, you should also be on the same email, uh, email list and should have received an invitation to the Gershenson lecture as well. Just um, um, just a kind of quick run of of what we'll be doing this evening. Um, I will move through our oops, sorry. We'll I'll be moving through our uh, welcome over the next kind of ten minutes or so, and then special presentations from Sahana Singh from the Hindu tradition and Miyoki Kane Barrett from the Buddhist tradition about opening the conversation. We'll have a little bit of question and answer. Then we'll move into one session of small group dialogue with moderators and come back for our conclusion. Please feel free if you're able to, to stay for 30 minutes after the dinner dialogue for a guided tour of the, of the gallery of, the, of Abraham. Let me stay right here. During Abraham, the special exhibit we hosted virtually between April 20th and May 21st, we've really enjoyed hosting um, keeps advancing, there we go, and showcasing this wonderful work from three accomplished artists. As Bishop Paul Gordon Chandler, president of Caravan notes, today's climate of increasing prejudice and stereotyping has resulted in an increase of populist nationalism and tribalism. One way to counteract is through creative initiatives that are based on what we hold in common. It is in this context that Abraham, an ancestral spiritual figure of distinct significance within three primary monotheistic faith traditions of Islam, Christianity, and Judaism has much to teach us in this timely artistic exhibition about Abraham's life and about living harmoniously. Abraham's life can serve as a guide toward creating cultures of peace, harmony, justice, and healing. You know, art has touched us all in many ways. While this is not, and, and this is again the context in which we come to the dinner dialogues of learning and sharing. This is not a religious painting, but in many ways it's a very sacred one to me. This painting, an Alfred Bierstadt landscape that hangs in the um, National Museum of American Art, uh, is a, been a companion of mine for 30 years. Uh, and I always, when I'm back in Washington, D.C., where I did my undergraduate degree, always visit the National Museum of American Art and sit in front of this Bierstadt painting for as long as I can. And it's just a wonderful, it's been a wonderful companion over the years. And it's also helpful to know that our artists have also been influenced. Um, as we quickly scroll through, for example, this is from Shea Azule, our Orthodox Jewish uh, painter, um, artist, and this is about um, the, from the theme of um, living as a pilgrim, but he notes that he was influenced by, again, one, another one of my favorite uh, artists, Kaspar Friedrich, um, which is called, this one's called um, Standing Above a Sea of Fog. And so our artists also have influences as well. And you can see the distinct similarities between, again, this kind of from kind of two different times and two different worlds, standing above the sea of fog and living as a pilgrim. We know that art is special because it activates the imagination. As we kind of look through and please stay afterwards for our gallery showing as well. Um, of the these pieces of art. And these are from, first of all, Sinan Hussein, and then Kesal Sindhi and Shea Azule. Our art, um, as we quickly scroll through the work of our three artists on five themes, we know that art is special because it activates the imagination and it brings us in touch with the transcendent. Creativity always connects us with something larger than ourselves. Art is invitational as well. We can all experience it. It is also transboundary. Art doesn't stop at national borders. So transcendent, imaginative, invitational, transboundary as well. And so these works, as we go through them, I'm going to just move them through them a little bit more. 
um, just as a reminder, Again, these are some of the concluding ones from uh, the five pieces of art by Kesal Cindy. And then we saw this one from Shea Azule. Uh, again, Shea Azule has got this wonderful, very whimsical um, approach to his artwork. Uh, and it's just very, very, it's just really fun. Oops. And this one's been really important to us as well, because this final one of the hands of blessing has been the one that we've used on a lot of our work. And what's really important here is then, I, I think, summarized in a quote from Leonard Bernstein. The point is, art never stopped a war. That was never its function. Art cannot change events, but it can change people. It can affect people so that they are changed. They then act in a way that may affect the course of events by the way they behave, by the way they think. And this, um, this exhibit has focused on, th on five themes that have been focused on uh, the, the story from Abraham. Living as a pilgrim, welcoming the stranger, sacrificial love, the compassionate, and a friend of God. But now it's time to enlarge the conversation, which is why this dinner dialogue is called um, Abraham in Conversation and an opportunity for other voices and new perspectives to be also introduced. Um, I'd like to welcome two women, members of our communities outside of the three traditions to share and to add their voices and their perspectives on the role of art and spirituality. I've not asked them to share as academics. What the dialogues have asked from attendees and speakers over the years is thought is reflection, is that personal touch for us to share of ourselves. And this is what I have asked from them tonight, to share from their experiences of art and faith from the, the Hindu tradition, the Sanatana Dharma, and from Buddhism, those who follow the Noble Eightfold Path. If you've been with me on one of my classes on world religions or on a visit to a faith community with me, you've heard me say that the approach to religion and faith between what are called the monotheistic religions or the Abrahamics, which is a problematic term in itself, and the non-monotheistic religions, which is a problematic term in itself, between what we sometimes call Western religions and Eastern religions, which are wholly artificial constructs in themselves, but they are very different approaches. And these differences are important because when we are with people who see the divine in different ways, it can expand our understandings as well. And I think that is one of the goals of the dinner dialogues and the goals of this exhibit for us to see in new ways. And so I'll welcome now Sahana Singh, and I'll, I'll um, introduce both of them right now. And um, Sahana Singh is an author and commentator based in Texas. She's an environmental engineer by qualification who writes on a variety of issues, including water management, environment, and Indian history. Her book on India's in, in educational heritage has been well received, and her second book on the same subject is awaiting publication. Sahana has won several awards for journalism, including the Developing Asia Journalism Award in 2008. Her articles have been published in Reader's Digest, Washington Post, Discovery Channel Asia, Asian Water Magazine, and other publications. She, Sahana is the director at Indian History Awareness and Research, IHAR, a nonprofit headquartered in Houston, USA. She's passionate about traveling and connecting the dots across different societies, civilizations, and disciplines. And then we also welcome, and let me go ahead and stop my share so we can see everyone. Uh, Miyoki Kane Barrett, who currently holds the position of Bishop of the Nichiren Shu Buddhist Order of North America. She is the first woman and the first American to hold this position. She's also the first American woman and the first person of African American and Japanese descent to be fully ordained in the Nichiren Shu Order. She is the guiding teacher and priest at Miyokenji Temple here in Houston. And she currently volunteers with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice as clergy for two prison sanghas, which in Buddhism is a word meaning community. She has been fully engaged in this work for 15 years as a full expression of the Lotus Sutra, which teaches full equality. She also supports weekend trainings for Healing Warrior Hearts, a Texas for Heroes project to, to, designed to truly welcome our veterans home. 
And again, before I uh, turn things over to Sahana, um, if you have not, if you feel comfortable, please put in the chat box your name and what has drawn you here. And since it's a dinner dialogue, please share with us what you are having for dinner. Sahana, the floor is yours and thank you for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you, Gregory. Uh, namaste to everyone uh, and a very good evening. Um, thank you very much for inviting me and making me and my faith a part of the conversation today. I, I look forward to an evening of uh, sharing and learning. So um, I love the idea of using art to explain religion. Uh, so in Sanatana Dharma, or what people call Hindu tradition, art is deeply infused by spiritual meanings. And uh, it is intended to take the viewers towards the ultimate truth. So art always has this intention of drawing you towards a higher truth. So uh, today, the theme that I have selected is uh, Ardha Narishwara. It's a long name, Ardha Narishwara, which means a particular depiction of the divine uh, in, uh, in which uh, the, the god, uh, the divine, is half female. Now, Ardha means half, uh, Nari means female. So Ardha Nari means half female. Uh, and Ishwara, Ishwara means the supreme divine. Uh, so when we join them all up, it becomes Ardha Nari Ishwara, which means the half female divine. So um, as you know, in the uh, Hindu traditions, we do not view God as uh, exclusively male. Uh, so we see the supreme uh, being as both male and female. Um, so we have many artistic depictions of the divine feminine as well as the masculine. But today what I'm going to show you is a composite of the male and female. It's a combination of Shiva, the male, and Parvati, the female. So in, um, in Sanatana Dharma, we have the freedom of interpreting the divine in a variety of ways. And all these um, schools of thought make us very pluralistic. It also make us, makes, us very, uh, uh, makes us debate all the time. So we are constantly uh, debating. Uh, so just give me a moment. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, so in our religion, we have, uh, we have the understanding that every human being is a combination of male and female. So um, a man is not male, uh, uh, not male just because he has the male organs, but he also has more male traits than female traits. And uh, similarly, a female is female, not merely because she has female organs, but because she has more female traits than male. So um, it's a spectrum and the male and the female are seen as having complementary roles, not competitive. And um, when we look at the Ardha Narishwara form, then we see them as inseparable. It's in, it is a particular depiction which shows the male and female as inseparable. The other thing is that uh, uh, we understand that the female form uh, is a dynamic one. So she is the force of nature. She is mother nature herself. So everything in nature that we perceive around us, like um, the mountains, the trees, the flowers, the sky, the storms, even the pandemic itself, all that we see as a feminine expression of the divine. Uh, and she is called the Shakti, the cosmic power or the energy. And on the other hand, uh, is the completely still uh, Purusha or consciousness, pure consciousness. And uh, some people call it the supreme consciousness. And some people see it as a male entity, while others see it as neither uh, male or female, because it is beyond all that duality of male and female. So um, this is actually a very deep concept to explain in a short time. But I'll show you some art in which the artists and sculptors have tried to uh, uh, depict the half female divinity. And um, I will start with uh, uh, what I'm actually wearing today. I'm wearing around my neck. Uh, I don't know if you can see this, uh, uh, a pendant. This is my first exhibit. Uh, so you can see uh, uh, a face which is half male, which is of Shiva and, the, and half female, that is Parvati. The blue side is the uh, male. I hope you're able to see this. 
And now, uh, this is actually a very common motif. So what I have on my pendant, we also see it in our in, in clothes, you know, wall hangings, uh, saris and things like that. So uh, let me just go on to share my screen. And I think you can see my screen now. Look, looks good. Good. So what? So I'll give you a glimpse of Sanatan Dharma via art. Oops, it's not moving. Yeah. So Ardha Narishwara is a special depiction of the Supreme Divine as half female, as I told you. And some of the images that I am going to show you are very ancient. The earliest images go back to the first century CE. And this depiction is shown in uh, it, it's in many of the temples uh, in India, especially the Shiva temples. So this is the first picture. It's a, it's a painting, as you can see. And this shows the Ardhanarishwara in a seated position. This is actually not very common. It's usually shown as standing. Uh, so you can see half the body, which is female. Uh, she's wearing a sari, Parvati. You can see her bindi, half a bindi. And you can see that there is more ornamentation on the female side. And you can also see the 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 tiger uh, the tiger or the lion sometimes it's a tiger sometimes it's a lion uh, which is the vahan vahan is the is the is the mode of transport the vehicle used by this deity so it is on her side and then on the male side you can see that uh, it is of a different color to distinguish uh, and you can see the hair it's all matted locks whereas on the female side you can see it's more neat uh, and then you can see the crescent moon, which is a symbol of Shiva, so which is on the, on the male side. And you can see the that he's uh, dressed in a different uh, kind of clothing, which is uh, you know the the skin of uh, a, a tiger skin typically, or some other skin of an animal. And then you see the uh, the vahana, the, the the transportation of Shiva, which is a bull, which is we we, we revere the bull as well, Nandi. So you see all this male and female both in one picture, so Ardhanarishwara. Now I'll take you to another one. This one is from, uh, uh, just a minute, I think I let, let's pick it up. Yeah. Huh. This is found in the Elephanta Caves in the Western part of India near Bombay, uh, but it's badly damaged because uh, when the Portuguese captured Bombay, then they destroyed a lot of these. So you only see the upper part a, a bit more clearly. So this is from the fifth century. This was made in the fifth century. And in fact, this whole place, the, the cave, caves are full of amazing sculptures and paintings. So I have zeroed in on Ardhanarishwara. And uh, today it's a UNESCO heritage uh, site. Uh, and so you can see in the female side, you can see the breast. So, so that is the female side. And then the male side is the flat chested, which is uh, Shiva. And then of course there are other, uh, figures depicted around the, the main uh, deity. And they are worshippers or whatever. Sometimes they are other celestial figures. Then you have this one, uh, again, Ardhanarishwara, which is found in the caves of Badami, which is in Southern India, in Karnataka, the state of Karnataka. And uh, this is interesting because there is a stringed instrument. There is a, it is called the Veena, which is held there, uh, held by uh, both the male and female parts, the, uh, so both Shiva and Parvati are holding this uh, Veena. And uh, you can, uh, if you go closer, you'll be able to see all the attributes, the breast and the, the, you know, the female side, more ornamentation, and the headgear is the, you know, more the neater comb side and all that. Uh, and then all those figures standing around, they are the worshippers. This is another one, a very beautiful uh, depiction of Ardhanarishwara. And uh, Again, you can see the, the, the single breast on the left side, and you can see the long ropes. You can see the folds of the ropes that the female Parvati is wearing. And uh, it's interesting that this is like almost like a dance pose, but uh, in order to balance the weight, we can see that Shiva is resting his um, elbow on the, on the Nandi, on the bull. So, but then the hand has been broken off again. Uh, again, I think the work of some, some of the invaders uh, so this is another uh, Ardhanarishwara. And in this one, uh, you can see this is the earliest. This is from the first century common era uh, from that, that period when the Kushanas were ruling over India. And uh, so we just have the bust of this Ardhanarishwara. We don't have the lower part. 
And uh, in this, again, you can see that the female side is on the left side, uh, is wearing huge earrings. And then you can see the hair, which is uh, combed and uh, uh, kind of styled well. And on Shiva's side, it's all matted locks uh, on that side. Uh, you can see the hair coming down right there on the, on the shoulder. So this is the, uh, the earliest Ardhanarishwara. And this is an interesting one. This is a much later depiction of Ardhanarishwara because it shows two faces. Uh, so both they have actually made the two faces of Shiva and Parvati. And uh, it looks like they've even made the Vahan, the, the, the transport, also uh, both male and female because the tiger looks seems to have a female and a male side as well. Uh, so this is interesting. And they've actually, there's, there's more detail in this. Uh, what else? So that's, because I'm just letting you see it for a while. And then I'll take you to the, another one. So this one is in Khajuraho. This is in central India. And uh, this is the view that was possible because it's, it's quite big. So you can't take it at eye level. And you can see all the usual, the single breast. You can see the different clothing. You can see the different uh, instruments and the weapons in the hands. Both of them, both the male and female side have two arms each, but sometimes it varies. And this is one that I took uh, last year or uh, two years ago. This is from Mahavalipuram, uh, uh, which is next to the sea. It's a beautiful temple. Again, you can see, you can see snake, uh, snake uh, on the male side because Shiva is generally associated uh, with snakes. There are, there are snakes around him. Uh, and so that's the reason that snakes are also uh, given a lot of uh, care and respect. You know, they are venerated as well because they are found with Shiva, uh, popular depictions of Shiva. Here is a smiling one, uh, a smiling uh, depiction of uh, Ardhanarishwara. Again, the hand is resting on the, uh, Shiva's hand is resting on the bull and you can see the whole hand. This has not been broken off, so it's special. And you can see the ornamentation as well. And uh, I got this picture of a sari, which is having the same Ardhanarishwara at the end of it, where we know when we, uh, not in the main body of the sari, which is wrapped around the body, but on the pallu, which is on the shoulder. So you can see Ardhanarishwara here as well. The blue side here, Shiva is blue and uh, Parvati is in, shown in yellow. She's shown wearing a sari, all the same elements. A close up. You can see half a bindi and you can see a different kind of marking on the head, which is typical of Shiva on the male side. This is another one. So all these motifs, you will find them on saris, dresses, and of course, you'll find them in uh, Shiva temples. So the question might arise that uh, why, do we, uh, why do Hindus worship images of deities? I think this is a question that often arises among the followers of Abrahamic religion. So uh, these images, they are called murtis in Sanskrit. They are viewed as physical representations of the infinite divine. So we know that the divine is infinite, but then we, uh, these are physical and finite representations uh, and it helps the people to, uh, the seekers to search for the truth because it helps to focus one's uh, dhyana, what we call dhyana, which is loosely translated to meditativeness. So we need that form. But then we know that uh, this is not uh, this is not all that there is. It is it goes way beyond that. And uh, also, when we do the uh, when we worship these images, it helps to inculcate within ourselves the qualities that are attributed to this particular form of the deity. So each of these deities has several uh, gunas or qualities. And when we worship them in that form, then we are not only hailing them for those qualities, but we need to bring it in ourselves whatever it is, it is, you know, where the love of learning, kindness, compassion, whatever are those qualities, we have to also bring it within ourselves. Uh, so when it comes to Ardhanarishwara, what is the significance of worshiping, uh, worshiping Ardhanarishwara? It reminds us of the inseparable nature of the divine feminine, the energy around us, as well as the still consciousness. So, uh, so for us Hindus, there is divinity both outside and inside. So we also regard that what is within us, that consciousness is also divine, uh, as well as the energy, the dynamism, the energy you know, to, to, do, to keep doing something, that's also divine. So in poetry, the inseparable nature of Shiva and Parvati has been described as 
similar to the relationship between a word and its meaning. Just like you cannot separate the word and its meaning, uh, you cannot separate Shiva and Parvati. That's a very famous piece of poetry. So when we invoke Ardhanarishwara, it helps to us to get in touch with the dynamic as well as the still consciousness within our own selves and both the male and female within our own selves. So with that, I thank you. Uh, may we all stay positive and keep our faith. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Uh, Sahana, thank you so, so very much. And we're good on, on time. Yeah. Um, uh, there are a couple of questions. Maybe we, it'd be helpful to do a little Q&A after each of the presentations. So Miyoki will be with you in just a minute. There was a question in the chat. Is the image of cattle associated with the male? Um, is is there a is there a gender is there a, a kind of engenderedness to the to the to the image of the cattle in the art that we saw? No, that was actually the bull. So it was because Shiva is associated with the bull. Uh, so that one is male. It's typically male. It was maybe there are some depictions where they try to show both, but uh, Shiva's uh, transportation is on the bull. So the bull is his vehicle. And that helps for me because I often use a um, a a, a, a picture of Ganesh, and people always ask, "There's is that a little armadillo or a little rat or a little mouse?" And because I believe since Gane that's Ganesh's vehicle, I believe uh, if I, if I got that right, yes, yeah. I'm not <laughs> giving bad information. Um, yeah. One of the other questions was in the pictures. It seems that the female is always on the left and the male on the right. And again, I don't know if it's kind of from the point of view of the image or the point of view of the viewer, but it seems that there's a consistency in male female orientation is yes. first of all did we see that right um blake i know blake yes. he's very perceptive and yes. is there a reason to this orientation yes the male is uh, the female is usually on the left and the male is on the right except there was one depiction that i showed which showed it the other way so uh, in general the larger numbers of people show the male uh, the female on the left where the heart the heart region that part is usually given to the female uh, so all those emotions, the feelings and all that, that is more attributed to the female energy. So that is on the left and the right side is given to the male. But then there are, as in India, you know, there is for <laughs> everything that is true, the opposite is equally true. That's India for you. So there are, there are a whole number of worshippers of the female, the, the, the feminine uh, divine, and they like to show uh, Shiva on the left and, the, uh, and, 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 the, and Parvati on the right, the female on the right because they think that uh, oh, they have reversed the roles, basically. Yeah. So for them, it is, uh, they show it that way. Is there, is there within the Sanatana Dharma a, um, uh, a, a, a privileging or a bias between the left hand and the right, and the right hand? Um, you know, there are a lot, uh, it's pretty common, interestingly, across traditions, across cultures, across civilizations, across times, that the left is often seen, because again, in Latin, the word for left is sinestra, which means sinister. And um, the, the, the word in Latin for right is dextra. Where we get the word like dexterous. So, I don't, is there a is there a, a biasing in in Hinduism? I know there's lots of Hinduisms between <laughs> left between the left sidedness and right sidedness. Yeah. So the right side is actually uh, dominant. Uh, so so that's the reason that those who uh, so the worshippers of the divine feminine, the Shakti worshippers, would show the the female on the right uh, because sure. for them that is the dominant side. I mean, that is the dominant side, the right is dominant. So they would show the female on the right, the, the worshippers of the divine feminine, Shakti. And then the others, the regular people who are, uh, so they would show uh, the, uh, the right as Shiva. They, the others would show the Shiva, Shiva on the right side. Yes, the right side is dominant. But again, you know, there is, uh, they don't really <laughs> see it as uh, in, in them in conflict. It is always more in terms of, you know, they are working together for the good of the people. So that's the way we see it. We don't see them in conflict. Thanks. And I'm happy to see any, any other questions. If you have seen the Abraham exhibit, um, you'll find that uh, Sahana's presentation and the approach to art and divinity within, the, within Hinduism, within the Sanatana Dharma to be really different. Um, and I think a wonderful kind of balance or an, uh, another, um, uh, uh, another approach to, again, kind of the very 
uh, in particular maleness of uh, of a lot of because well, because of the, uh, of the nature of the Abraham story. So, um, Saha and I very much appreciate your time and don't go anywhere um, because I'm sure there will be some more questions. I think after our small groups, uh, mm -hmm. let me turn things over to uh, Miyoki Kane Barrett. Uh, and uh, for uh, a little time with her out of the out of the Buddhist tradition. And again, thanks to Nate Church, who will be uh, working the slides. Oh, I think you're still hey, there. We go. You. Yep. Yes. And hopefully we'll be even. Um, thank you, Saha. Now we have much in common. As I was listening to your presentation, the, our I think the art that we can safely say related to the Lotus Sutra and other sutras was uh, brought about because of a desire to tell pictures, tell the stories of the sutra in pictures. And so uh, it was carried out usually in, in two formats as frontispieces pieces to different chapters or as hanging scrolls. And it wasn't until later as they tried to put in more detail of the stories that were being told in the sutras uh, that they stopped having any relationship to the stories that were in the sutra. So they were used as uh, impetus for um, what we call the picture explaining priests. Uh, so they would travel around with these pictures and teach the Dharma that way and became a popular form of sermons. Um, we also see them uh, depicted in, in two ways in the Lotus Sutra, um, primarily as, uh, could you back up the slide please? Um, a honzen or uh, what we call a central image of worship and which are used in religious services and rituals and devotions, and also illustrations of significant ideas of the sutra. So both are intended to promote faith in an understanding of the sutra. Now we can get into the slides. Um, so one of the things that is really important, to, especially today, uh, but there's a long tradition of those folks who are the artisans of carving uh, divinity. And if you notice here, what's really significant is the face of the Buddha. And this is, is uh, particularly noted as Shakyamuni because of the hand position, which is the meditation mudra. The next slide is the founder of our order, the Nitran Shu tradition. This is Nitran Shonen. And again, one of the things you notice uh, is the beauty of the face and the uh, adoption of, again, the meditation position. One of the rare pictures of uh, Nitran with his hands in the position we know as Gasho. Next slide, please. So, what is represented in most of what we'll see? upcoming is the title of the Lotus Sutra, which is Namu Myo Ho Renge Kyo, which means, Namu means devotion or respect for what follows. Myo Ho is wonderful or mysterious Dharma. Renge Lotus flower signifying cause and effect. And Kyo is the teaching or vibration. So it's devotion to the Sutra of the Lotus flower, the teaching of the Lotus flower of the wonderful Dharma. Next slide, please. This is another representation. And if you notice the blue stupa in the back, written in there is Namu Myo Ho Renge Kyo. And this would be considered a very expensive form because of the individual statues. And in the Lotus Sutra, uh, the stupa represents the stupa arising from the earth when the Buddha is teaching the Lotus Sutra and Taho Buddha comes out to verify um, the Buddha's teachings. And so he invites the Buddha to sit with him at the stupa. And these are the other uh, deities and bodhisattvas represented here in statue form. Next slide, please. Now here is a statue of the Buddha 
for no fear. And also the two statues at the bottom are Jizo Bodhisattva, thought to be the deity for uh, children and travelers, and also used in uh, the rituals for Mizo Kuyo or children who have been aborted, miscarried, or died at a, a very tender age. Next slide, please. You also find different kinds of stupas are called oihais. This one is particularly dedicated to all those who have died in the past throughout the universe. Next, please. Now, what I'm showing you is the altar of the temple here. And so we'll go into that in the next slide a little bit deeper. We are very fortunate that the, uh, this is a typical one, uh, a Gohanzan, a Mandala Gohanzan. And if you notice again, down the center is written, Namu Myoho Denge Kyo. And that's very much centered on uh, a great deal of the art that is used in our, uh, as objects of worship and ritualistic practice. And um, this one might be called a medicine omandara gohonzen, but it also includes uh, names of all the bodhisattvas that were present to indicate the multitudes of uh, beings that were present when the Buddha first started to preach the Lotus Sutra. Next slide, please. Now, this is the one that's in our temple and it's very unique. Uh, it was written um, and drawn specifically for our temple. So again, you have Namu Myoho Denge Kyo down the center. And you notice in very bold in each corner, those are the four heavenly kings, which are guardians. But down in the center is, uh, if you go to the next slide, this is Myoken. And this was drawn, hand-drawn by an artist. Uh, Myoken is the guiding deity of our temple because we chose that name since we are in the Lone Star State. And Myoken is the god of the North Star, thought to have keen vision. And he's also the uh, god of uh, horses and farmers. Next slide, please. Again, you notice this also represents the Buddha and Tahoe in the stupa arising from the earth. So what this is designed to replicate for us as we're looking at it and uh, is to understand that we continue to participate in the ceremony that was conducted when the Buddha was speaking, so, which is known as a ceremony in the air. We also have the smaller statue here of Nichiren Shonen as well uh, in his teaching pose. Okay, next slide. So these are some other deities that are represented. The uh, one on the left um, is Aizen, who is the uh, god of passion. Basically the, the wisdom king of passion to help us understand that whatever passions we might have uh, even if they are negative, can be transformed to the good. And that's what a lot of these uh, statues help us to recognize. The next one in the middle is the Saijo Inadi, which is the god of uh, uh, foxes. You might see the little fox head in the center, Very, uh, but it's the god of props and foxes. The next one is Kokuzo, uh, the goddess of wisdom. And so, you find a lot of these statues are used at various uh, temples or even as amulets to help people get through their daily lives. Next slide, please. This is uh, again, another scroll depicting the uh, Namu Myoho Denge Kyo. And the uh, deity here is Sichimen who was a dragon that lived atop a mountain. And there are pilgrimages to the top of this mountain that go on regularly throughout the year. Uh, but her object in life was to uh, listen to the teachings of the Buddha and protect the followers of the Buddha. 
And down in the corner here on the right, you'll notice that's um, Kanzeon or Kuan Yin in Chinese. And the one on the left is Benton, the goddess of arts and music. Next slide, please. Now this is one that you may see outside in the world um, on Peace Pagodas. Again, the Odaimoku is down the center and the picture of the Buddha. Again, this represents the ceremony in the air for the, and in this case, for the whole world to participate. Next, please. This is another uh, rendering of Miokin in statue form. Uh, again, uh, God of the North Star. Next slide, please. This is Kishimojin. And again, uh, in front of an Omandala Gohonzen. Next slide. Now, one of the things, the story of Kishimojin is a very powerful one. She is the queen of demons. And um, she used to um, devour the children of the villagers. And they would come to the Buddha and say, please help us. She's, you know, killing our kids. And so he, the Buddha kidnapped her child and she came to him seeking help. And he asked her, did she now understand how the villagers felt? And because of that, um, she stopped being the demon who would eat human flesh and instead um, became a protector of the villages and the ch children in particular and uh, is represented today by pomegranates um, because she stopped eating the flesh of humans. Next slide. Whoops, skip that one. <laughs> Okay, well, um, I have, there is a YouTube channel called Carving the Divine. And there's a young Japanese man who has undertaken the project of filming um, all about carving statues, the history of it, as well as um, uh, different questions about Buddhism. And he also has included Hinduism in his exploration. This is a, a taiko drum, which is also represented here with the sound of a dragon. I think Nate's uh, trying to figure out how to play it. So we'll see if we can make that happen. <laughs> so thank you, Nate. To play. <laughs> so. Yeah, not gonna play, sorry. Okay. <laughs> but that was it, I got a little lost there. No. But I hope you will look up Carving the Divine if you are interested in more information about the different statues uh, that can be found. Super. Um, a couple of, and there's a, a, a couple of questions. Um, talk, and one of them is one that I, that um, is one that I often have, the ears, long ears, large ears within the representations of the Buddha. Um, can you talk to us at all a little bit about what you know about, you know, why the ears are kind of when we find kind of big ears on, 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 a, on a bodhisattva? Uh, I think <laughs> if I remember correctly, it's about hearing the cries of, of the world because he's the father, the parent, teacher and sovereign of the world. Yeah. And especially all of us are his children. At least I think so. Um, are these deities or demons? I'm again, just a fascinating again, uh, really why again, why I think this is important because of this, of how the kind of the transformation of the grotesque into the good or the, the, the recovery of that which is seen as evil into, <laughs> into an ally. Um, are these deities or demons part of Buddhism itself? Were they borrowed from other faiths or cultures? Uh, you know, that's a complex question because there's nothing new under the sun in a lot of ways. Uh, but um, are, there, are there some parts that we, you know, that are kind of, kind of either borrowed or are adapted from other parts of the culture or ones that are kind of unique out of Buddhism? 
as I read it, they're all included uh, because when the Buddha talks about living beings, he excludes none of them. Um, and so like Kishimojin, uh, the representation I have of her is I love that because it reminds me daily that I don't have to change in order to become awakened. Um, that just as I am, I am good enough. And there are other representations of Kishimojin where she becomes this beautiful, you know, statue holding babies and things like that. And some people like that one, but I tend to like the, the wicked looking woman. Um, <laughs> it's just my nature. Uh, but <laughs> when the Buddha talks about, a ro the sutra talks about who's present, everyone, every living being from all corners of the world, all 10 directions are included. So you'll have dragons and, you know, Gandharvas and Asuras, all those weird words that name different kinds of critters. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that people have been trying forever to uh, rename in Western lingo. Right. I've got two questions, Mioke. Um, I'd like to start with the two questions to you and then I, because they also apply to Sahana, I'd love to get to the same two questions to her. Um, let's start. In both traditions, Wendy notes, depic depictions of hand placement seem very intentional. What is the significance of this in Buddhism? I mean, you mentioned the word mudra, which is a, a, a you know, the word about a specific a hand gesture, meaning something very important. Could you talk a little bit about the significance of, of hand placement? Well, essentially, it tells you the Buddha that you're looking at and the characteristics of that particular Buddha, like the one with no fear, there's one for touching earth, um, there's the teaching mudra, and it, it kind of gives you all of the characteristics that are available of the different uh, Buddhas. Because we tend to think of the Buddha as a single individual, whereas uh, the teaching actually talks about the Buddha as eternal. And there are many manifestations of the Buddha, and it just depends on what particular Buddha is needed in that particular time. I feel also just to take advantage of the opportunity as we expand a little bit beyond talking about art, but um, talking about Buddhism, is transformation a matter of heart? Is, is the transformation um, a matter of individual or social or spiritual responsibility? Valencia, if I didn't get that right, can you chime in and ask your question? You're close. I just, the transformation of the deity from being um, the uh, you know, the destroyer to the, the caretaker. Is that mm -hmm. a matter of heart transformation or is that social spiritual responsibility within? I would say it's all of that uh, because initially one of the things we learn is that our practice is always for others. You know, so the transformation that happens in your life as a result of that um, is for others as well. But it's also uh, the fact of our responsibility uh, to transform our world, to not leave it the way it is, you know, so that we're constantly recognizing that we're all in this together and each of us has a role to play in it. Um, one of our, my favorite expressions to remind myself of this is that it's more important for a thousand people to take one step than for one person to take a thousand steps because we cover more ground if we're all working together that way. Thank you. Sahana, if I could ask you to chime in particularly on the, the intentionality of hand placement or hand position within uh, some of those images that we saw out of the Sanatana Dharma. Yeah, so the, the Buddhas are actually similar the, because uh, Buddha, as you know, Buddha was born in India, which is all, I mean, so it's not, there's no really, uh, there was no compartment between Buddhism and Hinduism. If you go back in history, uh, Buddha didn't say that he belonged to a different religion or anything like that, because within Hinduism itself, there were so many schools of philosophy. So Buddha was like another guru who came along and he had his own uh, followers. Yeah, so the hand placements are usually significant. And uh, 
uh, in the ones that I showed you, there weren't any very significant ones, but uh, most of them were the Abhaya Mudra, which was in, the hand was cut off in many of them. Uh, so you couldn't see them, but typically uh, Shiva would be having a Abhaya Mudra, which is do not be afraid, everything will be well, uh, be fearless. That is uh, the typical mudra in which you find a lot of these uh, deities. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are many, many mudras. Uh, it will be very complicated to get into all of them. But yes, when, when the artists and the sculptors used to depict their, them, the deities, they would really need to be people who uh, knew all the legends around them. They would be well read in that. And so when they are depicting, they would take care to show all the mudras correctly, all the attributes correctly. Thank you, Awesome recording. Um, any report backs from, um, or additional questions from the small groups? If I could call, uh, give that responsibility to the moderator or moderators that were in the rooms. Um, any, anybody want to report back in with any additional questions or reflections? We'll start with room one, that would be Alina or Katie. Um, so one of the, when we were talking sort of about our first question, which was what really sp stood out to us in these presentations, and um, there were a couple of things. One was this idea of this spectrum of um, kind of gender and energy um, between male and female. We thought that that was really powerful and kind of um, resonated with our own feelings about spirituality in a lot of ways that uh, in our own faith traditions that's not so much presented kind of in the mainstream as much um, and then the other was just we all wanted to be able to sit in front of these pieces of art for like a few days rather than you know 15 minutes because the complexity is just astounding and and really profound um, and so this felt like just a sticking our toe in the water um, yes but but we also feel like this is the kind of thing that's necessary to start understanding these um these different traditions that we're not familiar with i mean otherwise we're there's not even a starting point right yep. and so um but that those were kind of the overarching um kind of initial thoughts from our group perfect katie thank you and i believe that the mfa houston's got a pretty good collection um, out of the Hindu tradition. Um, someone can correct me if I'm totally off, but I think it does. Let me go to room two with Helen. Kind of any brief report out or an additional question to throw into the into the chat box? Oh, you are muted still, the classic line. Yeah, we also were um, drawn to the concept of both the, the male-female continue on the spectrum and also the incorporation of the monster into the glorious. We really uh, resonated with that. And uh, we were so, so blessed and fortunate that Miyoki joined our group. So we had her to uh, enlighten us further as we uh, had our discussions. But we also kind of, we had to break away a little bit from that word spiritual because it was off-putting for some. So I translated that to awe or wonder and that got more conversation going good and so we had a, a longer conversation on question three and we're really uh just grooving when when you called us back to group <laughs> it's always the case <laughs> it's always the case I know. but it was it, it was yeah we had a uh, this is probably the most diverse small group i've ever had the privilege to moderate and yeah. so that was really fun too yep, yep. yeah I really enjoyed that. And like I said, Miyoki joining us was just awesome. Super. So. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Helen. And uh, that is one of my mantras of always, always leave them longing for a little more. So you'll come back. So okay. let me go to room three. I think Jessica and Haley and Nate, you joined in as well. Uh, one of you want to give just a brief report out any additional um, reflections? Uh, yeah, this is Haley. Um, I we actually focused on kind of a different initial question that I Super. thought um, is something that maybe um, uh, others could um, use as well. But we were talking about what art is in our lives from a day to day basis, like in our homes. What do we wear? What do we use for worship? 
whether it be daily or on a special holiday that we just, we have in our home. And so that was, and we had people of all different faiths than ours in our room. And so that was really fascinating to hear, you know, how, how, um, how we all use art in different ways um, daily. So, yeah. And actually I'm putting that in the chat so that, um, uh, so that it's in my record, because that's a wonderful question about the day to day and most likely happens more than you think when you sit and reflect, there are those more overt ways, but there are those more understated ways where, um, where, where art is, is, is useful and used um, on a, on a daily basis that we sometimes don't even realize. Thank you, Haley. Let me can go. I to... add, can I oh, add yeah, one please. thing? Sorry. Absolutely, Jessica. Props to Sahana because it that... It was something she did that I think inspired that conversation when she, towards the beginning of, of your, your presentation, you showed your necklace um, and mm -hmm. that just caught my, caught my eye. Yeah. And, and so kudos to you. You probably didn't even realize you were, you were inspiring our conversation, but I just wanted to share that with you because I thought that that was, Thank you. you know, worth noting. Yes. Super, thank you. Um, let's go to room four out of five. Uh, looks like Jim, you were the moderator in room four. Do you want to give a brief report out and any additional questions or thoughts? Yeah, uh, I would say that uh, our, our first overwhelming kind of response from a Jewish Christian group mm -hmm. was uh, how overwhelming and how different the art was reflecting the faith that it was depicting. Uh, and, and yet, by the time we kind of talked through some of the things, uh, I think there was a sense of how spirituality uh, transcends uh, various uh, religious traditions and how artistic expressions can help kind of uh, broaden us as human beings in our appreciation for those that, uh, you know, may not be from the same tradition that we are so it was kind of interesting that yeah. uh it was it was almost kind of overwhelming how different it was in the beginning and then it moved toward uh an, an understanding of the uh the ability of art and spirituality to kind of bring us together beautiful no absolutely what and one of my favorite phrases that i use about the study of religion it makes the strange familiar and the familiar strange mm -hmm. it takes what we know so from and 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 assume and decenters it and it takes that that which is initially very overwhelming and very different and um and and we and we begin to see the threads of similarity which is uh jim your 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 comment and your insights are 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 really Again, very, very helpful. So thank you. Let me go to room five. Um, Pastor Valencia Edner, you were the moderator in there and Wendy Cooper as and well. Wendy. So yeah. yep, sorry about that. Um, yeah. uh, I had to scroll down one spot more. Um, Valencia and or Wendy, I see your I see you first, Valencia. Do you want to uh, some commentary? Yeah. Um one wonderful in this room where questions were asked that were uh, eye-opening for everyone based on uh, their experiences with art in their lives and in their faith. Um, uh, because it was so eclectic in our space, it mm. made it even more, um, uh, we were able to share even more and to kind of cross-culturally look at some things um, that went beyond even the, the um, the questions or the thoughts about what we received tonight, but also to connect those things to things that have been seen before and music and art and dance and all and movement and all of that. Uh, if you will look in the if you look in the chat and you see two links that are that comes from our group, uh, one from uh, from Jay and one from myself to uh, look at what um, art has moved us uh, in our spaces. And we talked about a lot more than that. I'm gonna pass it over to Wendy so that she can add to that discussion, to what our discussion was, but I wanted to think, talk about the eclecticness of our experiences. Thank you. And I think what just the, the other thing that really we all kind of uh, spoke to was that um, art, in whatever, whether it's 
visual, music, movement, um, the experience of it is so individual and how that is spirituality. The experience of spirituality and the experience of faith yeah. is so individual. Um, and that's why those those two things can go so well together. Yeah. Wendy, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and if there are any links that you're referring to that you put in the into in the, into the chat rooms in your breakout rooms, I can't remember if those get recorded over. So if there are any links that you all were referring to that you used in your they're here. chat, they're there, they're in the main chat. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, thanks everyone for being here for this dialogue. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we've, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and, um, kind of go into some final comments and we can enter if you're able to stay for 30 minutes, um, and co and take a look at the art in the Abraham gallery, uh, which I'm excited about. Again, I've looked at this probably 30 times and now and I'm, 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 and I'm particularly excited to look at it now in light of, kind of this, the, 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 the new, um, kind of the new insights from because of our guests. Let me share my screen with a, um, oh, actually, yes, Jody, a um, couple of thanks. Uh, Jody Bernstein, our Vice President for Interfaith Relations and Community Partnerships. Do you want to unmute and have any final words? Um, my final words, really, just thank, thanks to Greg, thanks to Jet um, for a great time tonight. Um, I learned a lot. It was fabulous being in a small group with some of our amazing young professionals yeah. and our tried and true dinner dialogue participants. I love the legacy and the continuity and the continued relationships. I, I love it. Um, and I know these things don't happen on their own and that a lot of hard work went into planning tonight. So that's why I give Greg and Jet um, some kudos. And then also, um, say thanks to Jay Harbour, yep. who is is tonight. Maybe I'm stealing your thunder, Greg. But nope, not um, at all. Please steal Jay away. Is, Jay is our board chair who has come to almost all of our Abraham programming and everything else going on in IM. And it just speaks volumes about his commitment to our issues. So um, it, it's been great. The one thing that we did learn in our small group is some of us had very basic understanding of the face presented tonight. And they were almost stereotypes of the various faiths. And tonight helped us realize that it's not that, it's not that basic, that um, there's so much more to every faith. So it really just inspired us to learn more about yes. the different faiths. So kudos to our presenters for helping us, at least those of us had a very basic understanding to learn more and want to continue to learn more. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And I do want to offer a couple of other thanks um, to Ali Al Sudani, who's also here, our chief programs officer. And um, uh, mm -hmm. also, I want to just give a big thanks to both Sushma Mahajan, who is a longtime board member, as well as Vijay Palod, who are two very, um, you know, very faithful and very responsive and very knowledgeable um, uh, uh, contacts into the Hindu community who led me to Sahana. So um, I just wanted to thank Sushma and Vijay for their friendship and their collaboration. Um, oh, yes. I uh, just wanted to see if there are any other board members. Uh, Shanaz Waliani is also here, and she's also a board member. Um, and I think Jim Bankston's a senior board member as well. So a lot of leadership here that is taking their time to support us. So um, again, very, very grateful for, for all of you. Let me share my screen for one final slide, and um, we'll start to work our way into the um, into the gallery. Where are we here? Let me do slideshow, play from, play from current slide, and I think I may need to reshare, so just give me a second. It is here. So again, thank you for coming. Please stay for a 30-minute tour. 
please continue to visit um, imgh.org to learn about not only of upcoming events with um, with Abraham, but we, after Abraham closes, we've got a busy summer. Um, our next major event will be the Unity Concert on June 8th, and uh, will be a wonderful event sponsored by Empower, our women's leadership group. Also, as always, we ask if you would to please visit imgh.org and can please consider um, supporting our work through a donation. Um, let me go ahead and close that. Stop my screen share and click that closed. I see a, a couple of questions and then I'll let you all go or come with me into the gallery. Um, will we be able to find the recording of the presentations later? The answer is yes, we are recording these presentations. Jody and I just need to figure out when we have a moment to breathe exactly how we're going to share them. But we do consider these a true treasure trove of experiences. Again, um, the Abraham exhibit was supposed to be here May of 2020, but stopped its international journey in February in Jacksonville, Florida. And of all of the organizations that we're going to host after that, we're the first to um, to be back on the calendar because we chose to do it in this virtual format. Sushma, Ma, Sushma asked, would the art gallery be available on YouTube? If you will actually go to On Caravan, well, two things. Um, if you go to oncaravan.org and click on the Abraham, um, their Abraham link, you can see all the pick, all of the, the, the paintings. And this virtual gallery that we're about to go into, if you have time, um, starting probably middle of next week, if you send an email to Jet Phillips at gphillips at imgh.org. Jed, would you mind putting your email in the in the um, in the chat box? We'll send you the link to the uh, to the to the virtual gallery. So um Jay, uh, let me just actually ask our board chair. I'm gonna real. I'm, I, this is a stupid, a, a stupid question. Um, but do you have any close, any words you'd like to say, <laughs> Mr. Harburg? <laughs> well, I would shock you and say no, so I won't say that. <laughs> uh, I, I'll just tell you if you have any chance to stay for the next thirty minutes, uh, Greg's tour is not to be missed. Uh, if you don't have time, do it another night. But definitely. Uh, allow him to be your docent and, and guide you through the exhibit. It's fabulous. Uh, I've been doing these, uh, these dialogues since the very beginning. And uh, some of you I recognize from the very beginning. And uh, every time it's fun, every time you learn something and every time you get to meet someone new. And uh, I thank you all for being here, Greg. You, you're just, you know, you do an amazing job and all, all of our staff. And uh, if you will come back Come back soon and often, and we'll do it again. Thank you. Jay Harburg, Chair of the Board, thank you. On behalf of Interfaith Ministries for Greater Houston, um, our staff, our, our lay leaders, um, thank you for being here for this dialogue. I would especially offer a special thanks to Sahana Singh and Miyoki Kane Barrett for their time, for their presence, for their sharing. Um, we are grateful to the two of you for being here. So make sure to give me a round of applause for Sahana and Miyoke. Um, and um, I would very much look forward to the next opportunity that I have to work with, with the two of you. Um, Sahana or Miyoke, do you have any closing words? And then, we'll, and then I will definitely stop. Sahana? Yes, um, it was very enjoyable. I did not feel like I, I'm meeting all of you for the first time. It was wonderful even though we all have different faiths. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any other Hindu in this gathering, but I just didn't uh, feel like I was different from any one of you. So it was amazing. Uh, I hope that this is, I mean, all over the world, this is the way we could all converse and have uh, dialogues. So thank you so much for uh, including me in this today. Sahana, thank you. And Miyoki K. and Barrett, a couple of closing, any closing words? Well, thanks all of you. Uh, it was great to be with you, and like Sahana said, it's I didn't feel like a stranger. It's like walking into my own community. So uh, uh, all I can say now is a deep gasho to all of you, or namaste, that the Buddha in me bows to the Buddha in you, and thank you so much. Miyoki, okay, thank you.
again, on behalf of Interfaith Ministries, thank you for being here. This concludes the formal portion of the dinner dialogue. And uh, in about 30 seconds, I'm going to take us into the uh, into the gallery for a uh, for a 30 minute tour, if you'd like. Uh, thanks for being with us.